So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. That's what they want. They want to create the cultural phenomenon. Yeah. Buff out the idiosyncrasies so no one's uncomfortable. That's true. That's true. But it's also very shiny. It's like it a golden turd. It's still golden. That is one philosophy. It's also still a turd. But it's golden. Therefore, but... it has value. Oh. Right? I'm confused. First impressions? First impressions. What do we have today? We got Booksmart or Good Boys. Which one do you want to do first? Booksmart. We haven't done anything. We haven't broken any rules. Name one person whose life was so much better because they broke a couple of rules. Picasso. He broke art rules. Rosa Parks. Name another one. Susan B. Anthony. God damn it. Picture this. I'm a bag of dicks. Put me to your lips. Hand sanitizer. Check. Chapstick. Check. Mace. Listen, it is very important that you keep the safety. Oh! watched the trailer for book smart what'd you think i i'm mixed i mm -hmm. think i'm gonna laugh at it i don't know if i'm gonna love it mm. you know it's like in between like i feel like i might not like it as much as the trailer's convincing me to like it ah if that makes sense like i'm starting to see through it seems i have seen this trailer mm -hmm. um probably three times now yeah um and i just I always get nervous if this is the best jokes, kind of, sometimes mm, when I see a comedy trailer, trailer. Uh, yeah. especially after last year's Gringo with Charlie Theron. Um, yeah. that, that just, the, all the best jokes were definitely in the trailer. And it had nothing else. <laughs> well, it had, it had some other stuff, but it wasn't a comedy. It was more of mm. an uh, adventure movie mm. than comedy. And I, I don't know. I think that what I found most exciting was probably Olivia Wilde's directing style um mm. specifically in the car there's some interesting shots where she kind of shoots it like as a lurker um mm. like like as someone who who's hiding from the scene itself behind the bushes and the way that the camera is kind of moving as stuff tracks i found interesting um but i definitely laughed what did you think I am excited. Um, I like both of these actresses, Beanie Feldstein in particular. Been eager to see her in something ever since Lady Bird. She was hilarious in Lady Bird. She was. Um, and Caitlin Dever, right? Dever. Dever. Um, uh, you know, she's not one that like uh, I write and rave about, but I've I've liked most of what I've seen her in. I think they they seem like they have great chemistry. Um, um, like they're having fun together. Agreed. Um, that's always key, you know, just they, they have to kind of look like they want to be there in the first place. It's, it seems very sincere. Like, it's 100%. definitely a, a passion project for Olivia, and everyone's showing up for it. I just, yeah. I have to question the screenplay, because it's comedy, and, mm. you know, they, they have their own track record, you know. For every Pineapple Express we get, we get ten movies that are just terrible comedies. And, um, hopefully this will be more of a um not it's probably not gonna hit game night level but what was that other comedy that came out last year that you really liked maybe more of a cock blockers oh uh um, blockers, blockers is what the what yes. the name is that they went to and then they put the o as a chicken whichever right? one yeah yeah <laughs> that must have uh, tested better at some point in the stages because do you remember mm -hmm. when they were advertising it as cock blockers no i didn't know that that oh, was yeah. a, a real possibility yeah i think it was like eight months or beforehand they had started advertising kind of like serenity got those uh got those ads in like last august oh yeah yeah came out yeah yeah great comparison um there's just not enough of this kind of movie for my for my liking like i just wish we had more comedy of this kind um yeah it's kind uh, of the high school comedy like uh super bad was but for girls and i definitely, definitely want to be able to laugh twice as much because there's twice yeah. as many stories as we're getting so yeah um yeah eager to check it out jason sudeikis has a nice little sporting role olivia wilde's boy most definitely let's get to the good boys <laughs> When you see real people kissing, I have an idea. Oh! Yeah. How many 
many husbands does she have? Get out of there, girl! <laughs> Nobody even kissed. Well, not on their mouths, at least. All right, we just watched the trailer for Good Boys. You were still giggling <laughs> seconds after it concluded. I assume you are excited. I am quite excited. This is one of those comedy trailers that I find more, um, I respond to more. Like, I, I have less doubts about. Because mm -hmm. about probably two minutes into the trailer, they do this quick cut of really 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 funny jokes back to back to back to back to back just with audio while they're on a separate thing mm -hmm. that tells me that they've just got jokes on jokes on jokes on jokes in this movie and every moment i watched i was just like this is hilarious and then they do a, a fast cut of some images that shows us how they're gonna hem the story together and make it a narrative which is mm -hmm. a duty that all movies have to do but that it's generally going to be funny throughout and it, i definitely got a pineapple express vibe mm. that super bad vibe which you know it it doesn't shy away from bragging about its producers which are seth rogan which it opens with uh, understandable I, I'm, I'm okay with that what did you think um i think i'm the reverse where i think i'm more um nervous about this one than book smart actually um, I do think it looks funny. I will most definitely laugh for me. I think I worry a little bit about authenticity. I don't know that kids I, <laughs> swearing. Yeah, I mean, funny. The end. It's I, I I I worry. I just I'm, that I'm going to be reading an adult script that kids were asked to read. I mean, I don't know that I've. It's a trailer. I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. You know, I mean, I definitely don't have any idea beyond the jokes, like who these people are. Um, but um, I'm willing to hold out hope. Like I mean, I'm that, still optimistic. That one-liner. Still... This isn't a fucking sippy cup. This is a juice box. Yes, it is. Like, do you remember in sixth grade when you were definitely still a child in retrospect, but you thought you were like an adult? Like this definitely oh, speaks sure. to that version of me that I still am today. However, with age, so I, I don't. There's a certain mm -hmm. sincerity that I. I definitely found in that screenplay of like that is exactly the shitty way that we thought and behaved as that age of child. Yes, I mean I certainly might be able to to put myself in that mind space where I'm thinking, oh yeah, I was like that. But I hope the movie does that for me. Um, I, I am confident it will be joke dense if the trailer is any indication. But character rich, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I we'll would see. agree. the The characters definitely seem like cookie cutter, paint by numbers. You got your three friends, and then they've got the cop that's chasing them, and then they've got the hot girl next door who they want to learn things from. Yeah, I mean, and they can be tropes, um, but you know, I want them to be kind of like well realized too. Um, I mean, I I always that's what I loved about Superbad is that like I do feel like I knew Michael Sarah and Jonah Hill like as those two guys as characters um you can say the truth you were those characters <laughs> that too <laughs> they were um, me <laughs> but, um yeah still still eager to see it no doubt yeah well we'll see who's right and i Here can't wait to find out do we know i just withheld our cheers do we know the release dates on these are they coming uh, out summertime ish it would memorial be day I, summertime it would be lovely if they lined up We'll make a lot of I bet they'll we'll both be work. in theaters at the same time. We'll figure yeah. it out. Jesus Christ. You are not allowed to hunt on the grounds of a family vacation destination. Uncle Sloth was all American family life was meant for you and me. I want to get her on my waterbed and part of Red Sea like oh. Moses. Nice. How lucky we are. A live Sasquatch of fantasy. Love in the time of monsters. That's right. This is a local um, Pacific Northwest made production. Um, it is our introduction to camp. We both watched it together last week after we recorded our episodes last week. And it absolutely prepared me for what was to come. It, it was definitely a good primer um, for an episode on camp. Um, it was uh, a, a 90 minute uh, flick or so. I want to see 1993. Let me go grab the case. This yeah. is one of those uh, rare mm -hmm. things where we actually have the 
physical DVD sent to us from yeah. the filmmaker. Yeah, so our runtime here was 97 minutes. There you go. A little longer than I thought. And it has <laughs> the likes of Doug Jones, Kane Hodder, and Michael McShane. Quite the assembly of known talents in their own rights. Um, I, I didn't really know anyone besides Doug Jones personally until I started digging around. Neither did and I. And these are all um, people that are beloved in their own respective communities. Kane Hodder is beloved by the horror community. Uh, Michael McShane is that um, a, a well-renowned uh, L.A. Um, stage actor, from what I understand. About. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and one of the things that I came to appreciate on reflection of this film this week mm. was the title. Aha. Uh-huh. Love in the Time of Monsters. Before you came over, I decided to do a cursory search. Love in the Time of is mm-hmm. what I searched on Letterboxd. Let me read you back some of what I found. Love in the Time of Cholera. Love in the Time of Twilight. Love in the Time of Civil War. Love in the Time of Money. Love in the Time of March Madness. Love in the Time of Advertising. Love in the Time of Malaria. Love in the Time of Antidepressants. I think you just planned another episode for us. I... I basically did. Like, yeah. what a great campy title. Like, if I understand anything about camp, it is taking something that is broad and making it aesthetically different in a niche way, almost? I don't know. This is just one of those things where I actually understood what was camp the whole time we were watching it. For comparison, have you seen any of those? I have not. I've seen Love in the Time of Cholera in my okay. youth. Um, in your youth, yeah. Yeah. Not not exactly fresh. Not fresh. Not fresh at all. And yeah. I, yeah. I think I read the first third of it. Uh, it's a Gabriel Garcia so, oh. uh, book. I think uh, it came out in like 2007. Is that right? Got it. Yeah. Fact check me, people. Yeah. Um, maybe just uh, for uh, listeners' benefit, I'll just read the IMDb plot summary. Two sisters travel to a cheesy tourist trap where they battle toxic monsters dressed in Bigfoot costumes in order to save the ones they love. Directed by Matt Jackson, write, written by Michael Scavaria. Um, and uh, I think this is a... Uh, fun movie which is exactly what uh that plot description uh leads you to think it will be kane hodder uh becoming a super how do you even say like a a zombified electrified (laughs) yeah super character it's just hilarious right um (laughs) if folks are browsing for it and find it and see the Bigfoot on the cover. Bigfoot, plural, I think is still Bigfoot, correct? Or is it Big Feet? I think uh, it's Bigfoot. Bigfoots? I'm going to go with whatever you decide. I think it's Bigfoot. For clarity, these, in fact, are people in Bigfoot costumes. Who Which we are... did not know until we exactly. finished it. That, yes. yeah, the, and um, that, now I'm looking at the cover, that's clearly Kane Hodder's Bigfoot, isn't it? Because it's electrified. It most definitely is. Yes, <laughs> and I yeah, and I don't just mean actors in in Bigfoot costumes. That is true, but I mean the characters are people, humans who have been um, electrified, um, so, turned well, he undead. Was electrified. Right. They fell into a pond, became undead. Right. Remain in their Bigfoot costumes. Or did they become undead? I don't. I know that they became infected. Right, undead is sort of what they what it seems like. Yes, that is seems they're, like, they're like the closest comparison. Flesh, right? Yeah, they're biting fingers off. Right, right. Um, so no real Bigfoot, or is there, in this movie? Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it um sets the stage right away with its sort of over the top sensibility. Right, with the family photo in the first five minutes being taken and the father of two young girls being um, cleaved by Paul Bunyan's giant axe the right. giant Paul Bunyan statue yep um, or I mean life-sized Paul Bunyan statue <laughs> you'll know by, by then I think if this movie's gonna be for, be you, for you or not yeah 
um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not hiding what it's about. It certainly isn't. It no. is trying to find love in the time of monsters. This is the first As time I ever does. saw Doug Jones, not a monster costume acting. How about you? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I think it was great. I think he it was, was really, he was, he was really charming. Funny. Very oh, magnetic as a performer. Yeah. I thought to myself, wow, he just seems like a really sweet man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Abraham Lincoln, that is. Um, there's the squirrel moment, which we heard tell about um, before watching it, that was incredible. And there was that, that was the scene, right? Um, a squirrel goes inside of this girl who is naked and bursts through her chest in between her breasts. That's correct. Kind and of. That is when I turned to you and I said, "If camp was an image, this would be the image that camp is." <laughs> Precisely. These a infected bit, uh, squirrels bursting through her chest. Yeah, a bit like Alien, just about six inches higher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, kind of like we were just talking about in first impressions and the importance of just. Uh, Having a, having a cast uh, look like they're having a good time as they're doing this, I think it definitely passed that test for me. Absolutely. Uh, right? Um, just, uh, you know, that people look um, uh, enlivened and that they're, and they're committed. Um, that, that, that means uh, a lot, especially when you're going for this kind of over-the-top The importance of dance in order to oh, yeah. uh, distract Bigfoot. It's a, it's a real mm-hmm. thing. It is. <laughs> um, it's a major takeaway. Um, it's certainly one of the things I learned and will remember um, the next time I am attacked by people in Bigfoot costumes. That are infected and perhaps electrified. Correct. You need to put a barrier between you and them. They yeah. need to be able to see you. You need to have a light. You need right. to dance and shake the light. That is the it only makes way sense to survive. To me. <laughs> I would have done the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. Still, I'm not sure. I don't know if we ever decided if it was the Fourth of July or if this is just an American American themed tourist trap. It's definitely an American themed tourist <laughs> trap, but I feel like it was a holiday weekend. Right. That I could just be. don't yeah. know if it was Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day weekend, <laughs> One of Fourth those. of July weekend, uh, yeah. or just you know middle of uh, April and just celebrating America. Yeah, yeah. This 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 is a tourist trap run by a like Russian Slavic, I think. Not is Russian. it Slavic? Yeah, Slavic, that's right. Yeah. But um he is just psyched about the US of A. He he is psyched to make a profit <laughs> off of the US of A. Yes. That is correct. <laughs> um a, a few uh single liners to maybe mm. de- define this film, um, that are printed on the D V D itself, which is not rated because it you know it doesn't need to be <laughs> blood babes and bigfoot kicks freaking ass it definitely kicks people in the ass it does there is blood there is babes there is bigfoots is All that true. is it bigfoot bigfoots big feet did you decide for us i'm going with bigfoot Th- this is th- like the definition of a passion project like this is mm-hmm. indie filmmaking like i'm going to make a movie we're going to go make it. And it, it turned out extremely well based on everything that I know about its budget and what they went for. The, uh, the synopsis on the back of it here is love in the time of monsters is a suspenseful campy, hilarious horror film that weaves an outrageous tale of love and zombie Bigfoot. So they're zombies through the dark woods of Northern California. Two sisters, Carla and Marla travel to a cheesy tourist trap, for a weekend getaway only to arrive in time to battle toxic monsters dressed in bigfoot costumes determined to save their loved ones they must become heroes but what happens when the real bigfoot arrives you just give me the chills that's a, that's a great definition they did better <laughs> than we could that is one thing i forgot is uh one of the gals boyfriend rolls in and he becomes infected as well correct yeah that's correct yeah, yeah. so there is a real love in the time of Monsters going on threatens here. to tear them apart. Yes, and we've Most got definitely. we've got what a, a group of birds that are zombified. Oh yeah, we got the squirrels that are zombified. We got the Bigfoot. Is there anything else? Uh, creature wise, um, yeah. 
Wasn't there was there a moose? There? Yes, there yeah. was a moose. Uh, honestly, I Great said that zombie moose. I thought to myself, did I dream that? No, <laughs> <laughs> but no, there that was real. <laughs> yes, this movie is dream inspiring. <laughs> it is. Um, I'll just make one note about uh, the the essay I sent you, which in yes. uh, in anticipation of the episode, there's you know an essay called Notes on Camp by Susan Ta- Susan Sontag. That is not outdated at all. I think it was written in 1967. 64. 64, sorry. I will correct you. Um, where, you know, she's, she talks about her uh, sort of uh, definition of camp, Tiffany lamps. Which certainly can be camp. <laughs> um, I love lamp. Number, point number 60, or 56 in the essay is camp taste is a kind of love, love for human nature. Point fifty seven camp taste nourishes itself on the love that has gone into certain objects and personal styles, and you just like you said, it's a passion project. It's about feeling how much you know heart is going into the project. Yeah, you absolutely feel the heart of this. Yeah, like we were having fun while we were watching it. We mm-hmm. were laughing, we were drinking, we were smiling. It was a good time. Eating steak sandwiches and pretzels. We were eating steak sandwiches and pretzels. I forgot. All good things. (laughs) All right. Well, that was Love in the Time of Monsters. That's our indie movie for the week. On to Barbarella. Her name is Barbarella, and she makes science fiction something else. Jane Fonda is Barbarella. Barbarella is a five-star, double-rated astro-navigatrix Earth girl whose specialty is... Love. Shall I tell you what I would like? I think I know. Her top secret mission is a real wing dinger. All right. Barbarella. Directed by Roger Vadim, I believe. Starring Jane Fonda. The inspiration for the band Duran Duran. Is that right? Mm Mm-hmm. No way. I did not know that. Learning new things already. Love it. You watched the movie, correct? I did. So you know that the man she's looking for is Duran Duran. I do. I um, I was just like, huh, I wonder. I didn't know that that was actually an inspiration. I thought it was perhaps a coincidence. Makes sense. I have a feeling Jane Fonda in Barbarella was the inspiration of many a teenage boy at this point in time. Seems likely. <laughs> Reasonable to assume. And I think most bands are often teenage boys. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> to be the boy mm. that Jane Fonda's looking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was one of the ones that you were interested in watching this week. Anything that had put it on your radar or just one that he had always I've been interested I've always in? heard about it. I love Jane Fonda as a performer. Now we see her with... Uh, Lily Tomlin and June Diane Raphael in that Netflix series. What's that called? Grace and Frankie. Grace and Frankie, yeah. And I've really come to appreciate her as a performer in this, in The Old Man and the Gun. Was she the love interest in that, or am I thinking of the other Robert Redford movie on Netflix? Uh, it might be the other one on, on Netflix. Okay. I don't think it was Old Man and the Gun. Yeah, yeah. She was in she was in one that was just like a straight up romance um movie mm. with Robert Redford. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. Um, no, and about. I really, really liked that movie and I've I've just always wanted to go back and revisit her work and think about her as a performer. Mm. You know, like that's kind of a, a a tough thing to do. And when I was watching it I was thinking, um, back to shoot, what what's what's that gal's name? We watched Bombshell. Um, we watched oh, yeah. a documentary called Bombshell. Um, yeah. What was the name of that gal? Do you remember? Uh, Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar. Yeah. The Hedy Lamar story. And she had been in a film in Austria, Hungary, Germany. It yeah. was kind of a porno film, a little yeah. bit like this. Definitely an and, exploitation kind of thing. Um, yeah. It, it just drew a lot of similarities to me about like how mm. these performers have to kind of stake their claim, differentiate themselves and then move forward. And I thought there was a lot of similarities maybe between the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about from that documentary. I wish I could remember like more about it, like more like the, or I don't remember the title, but I know exactly what you're talking about. That's a, it's a great connection. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those kinds of movies. There are some movies where you respond to an actor, but you could just kind of easily swap them for, you know, anybody else. 
and still be no. please. Not you can't do movie. that here, right? She's pulling a Tom Cruise. Yeah. You cannot um, get rid of Jane Fonda in this movie. She yeah. is the gravitational pull that makes anything that's unbelievable okay. And the whole movie's unbelievable, and she's mm. what makes it okay. Um, mm. So I read the first half of volume one, or about the first half of volume one of Barbarella, which was uh, 1960, no, 1950, um, maybe 59, maybe 60, um, comic book in France, mm. science fiction comic book. Mm. Very, so, so the plot is different, the, what happens is different, but the themes are very much the same. Mm. The costumes, very much the same. Oh, yeah. Uh, the exploration of sexuality, very much the same. And mm. um, it definitely opened me up to think about, uh, what was that Luc Besson film from, was it last year or the year before? Um, Valerian? Valerian. So Valerian mm. is a is based on the German comic Valerian. Mm. Um, and um, I, I was just thinking, and it's also carries over to French. Mm. Um audiences extremely high i was just thinking like why don't these movies transfer for us like what mm. we get a camp version of barbara which becomes a cult classic kind of because of her body it's kind of like why we talk about miley cyrus's wrecking ball as much as that's a pretty yep. decent song we're also talking mm. about the fact that she's naked on a wrecking ball there, there is a certain thing to people that are in cult uh, people that are beautiful in the the consciousness of culture then getting naked and performing mm. for us and maybe shirking expectations um yeah that i think is why barbarella became what it became but i think it's more ownership of like people that desired jane fonda oh yeah, yeah. or the, like that's more what this movie is not an exploration of these of the themes that are in the comic book even yeah, yeah, yeah. You would you would think that the the appeal was largely the sex appeal more so than the themes. exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would agree. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, just fascinating to think about like what this would have played like in uh, I think it was 1968 that when this when this came out versus now, right? Yep. I mean, that's just the question about any of these movies that have taken on that kind of cult status um, is is just how did it play then, um, like. 1968 was the same year that 2001 came out. Like, can you imagine, like, going to the movie theater and debating between, do I want to see this sci-fi movie, Barbarella, or the new Kubrick film? Um, you know, it's like, th these movies just change so much over time. Um, but I think the appeal kind of remains the same. Like, it's still Jane Fonda, um, and it's still the costume design, the production design. Um it's like they they kind of take on this new status but what what draws people in i think remains kind of the same um yeah um i think uh i responded probably more so to the production design um and and costume design and just all that kind of um i loved all outlandishness too. yeah maybe even more so than jane fonda it sounds like you responded to her more As a performer, so than i did yeah well i've been I've been very interested in her ability to perform because mm. I've only seen her as a, as a older woman perform. Mm. And I've been very interested in seeing how she might stack up to someone like Jennifer Lawrence, who's a sex symbol now. Mm. Right. And I think that she's just, you know, acting on par or even better than Lawrence is in this movie. Like mm. when she says some of the bullshit that she says, just the way that she's so sincere about it you know like i watched um what's that piece of shit movie with chris pratt that lawrence did passengers passengers right like she's okay but you know that she doesn't really believe what she's saying like there's she lacks a certain conviction and mm. i think that jane fonda just had so much conviction in this movie like mm. when they're in that bullshit labyrinth with the angel you almost like agree that okay we're in the labyrinth mm. jane like you you're telling me we're in the labyrinth i believe you believe that like the amount of conviction your character has when you say when you're behaving and w when you're acting when you're in dialogue is just so high that i have to believe you yeah um 
I would agree. Um, I, yeah, I don't but know. But the production design, oh my gosh, yeah. when yeah. when the, uh, what is it, like they do time travel or like they they do whatever they're doing and then this like bullshit liquid is like changing levels. Oh, yeah. I loved that. Like I couldn't believe how absurd it, but also like lovely it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes like the most interesting thing to talk about a movie is, you know, the ideas, the themes, all that good stuff, but sometimes it's better to just talk about the stuff in it, right? Like, um, you know, the 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 frozen landscape, right? Um, the flesh eating dolls, the hot pink spaceship, the um the uh what is it, the wind sail? Yeah. With wheels. Oh yeah, yeah. Um the the angel, of course. The uh um, what is it? The the fingering machine of death? Oh yeah. That <laughs> Uh, which you withstands, of course. The Mothmos. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody in the labyrinth, um, like growing into the rock itself. That was great. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just all. It's just kind of a feast for the eyes, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I wish it did have like a bit more narrative momentum for me to like really just luxuriate it in a little more. I think that held me back. Um, but, uh, if you're coming for that, I mean, I think it delivers right on the visual front. I, um, I honestly, like, I finished it and then I, I was doing some other stuff and I just put it back on. Yeah. Good thing to have in the back. And I was just sure. like, yeah, this is just one of those things. Like th- there are certain movies that I can just watch on the periphery forever mm. and just laugh at just to, like have a goof Austin Powers The Spy Who Shagged Me is one of those movies uh, Pineapple Express is one of those movies like it just oh, yeah. for some reason I can just keep laughing at the absurdity of like this dude talking her into sleeping with her uh, her sleeping with him in the back of his sailboat or his land sail <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> like, it's just so absurd <laughs> yeah, yeah and me, it's yeah. see through <laughs> And there's a bed in the back of it, and it's only big enough for, like, one position sexually. Like, it's just so... And the fur. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, (laughs) The metal dick walls. Like, come on. The ship is so funny to me because it looks like it should be able to sail the Atlantic. But, like, the frozen lake looks like it's about, like, 50 feet long. Like, you can see where this, like, studio almost ends. And that's, like, another kind of camp thing for me is, like, when so, some of that, like, when the scenes show, it, it somehow is just charming and not, like, eye-rolling. Like, when they um, zoom out and it just does circles on the ice as they're banging. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which is a really hard thing to, art- I, I think it can be hard to figure out, like, why that works sometimes and, and why it doesn't. I think that's why I find camp interesting sometimes um, is you you recognize that this is you know, by conventional sense, bad, but it's very enjoyable. Did you have a favorite and scene? I did. My favorite scene for sure is early at the, um, my favorite scene is when she first crash lands on the new planet. She's in the, uh, ice landscape, basically that whole segment of the twin girls, um, ah, yes. dragging her or not dragging her, but bringing her across the lake in the sled pulled by like a manta ray into a cave with a pack of wild children who then... So the manta ray thing fits the creature universe of the comic. Ah, okay, so that that is... that yeah. There is a foundation for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the kids uh, set loose uh, flesh-eating dolls on her. Uh, I was like, yep, I'm in. And she's somehow stuck in between three, like, poles that are yes. very wide. Like, it's yes. just... Very Yeah, stressed. it was absolutely so absurd. What about you? Um, very similar to yours. However, mine is the second crash landing Mm. after she goes up and they begin to crash and she says like i don't remember what exactly she says but she says engage like the subterranean uh module so Mm. that she can like burrow the ship through to travel underneath the earth yeah i was just like yes (laughs) like that is exactly what i want my science fiction to be like we have a problem we're going deeper in. <laughs> yes. I, I was genuinely confused. I was like, wait, are they, are they going through the, the ice? ice? Like, why yeah. didn't they do this before? <laughs> like, what, I, like, I'm trying to, like, conceptualize what this planet, and like, is. And then in the ice, of. there was lava. 
Remember? Oh, yeah. Like, it's, oh, yeah. it's just the best. Wrap your head around that. That I, is like some Christopher Nolan mind-bending stuff. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Pretty hard to get your head around. Uh, yeah, great stuff. I, yeah, this, is, this was my favorite camp movie out of all four. We've got Love in the Time of Monsters, Barbarella, Welcome to the Dollhouse, Johnny Guitar. There you it's, go. I liked it the most. I think it is the most uh, well-earned camp. I think. Interesting. I yeah. think after what is it, fifty years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I the fact that it holds up the way that it does, mm. and her performance holds up the way that it does. The absurdity of the angel, um, just the the bizarre choices of music that are so hilarious now. Like, I I don't know. I just there's something charming and absurd and hilarious about the whole project. And it's steeped in this science fiction comic book, which is textually rich, which there you go. I like. <laughs> Not your favorite? Uh, my favorite is still yet to come, yet but to come. Uh, okay. I am positive. I no announce doubt. which one it is when, when we get there. I what shall. was your score on this one? Uh, three. Three and a half. With a there heart. you go. So this well, is I give it a heart. peak yeah. camp for me. There you go. Um, all right. On to the dollhouse. Don't let me put it to you straight. We're not here to get you. But you've got to understand, you're in junior high now. This goes in the computer, on your record. These dolls don't have teeth. They're not chewing up Barbarella's outfit. No, they do not. I think you only see one doll in Welcome to the Dollhouse. I think she cuts off her sister's... No, you see a few. Because see her, a few? her sister keeps picking up dolls with missing heads. Okay. Oh, okay. So she maybe decapitates numerous heads. Yes, she does. Of the dolls belonging to her This sister. is the Todd Salons film, Welcome to the Dollhouse. That's right. I've seen one other Salons film, Wiener Dog. Me too. Yeah. Only other one. There you go. I think um, it was on Prime last summer. We, we had already met Don Wiener once before. We had. Um, this was my favorite camp title of the week. Um, Close. I think, I think there are campy things about it, perhaps. I think I like it um, more as a movie than the other movies, but mm. like the camp i don't know barbarella's camp mm. quality there's yeah. something so sincere and earnest i definitely think barbarella is far campier the more i, I thought about this the less campy it felt to me um i, I think i yeah. understand why people would 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 use the word um there there are maybe campy things about it but i don't know that i would the just last half that kind genre. of melted away for me like i didn't see what was camp about it in the last half mm. whereas the first half where like everything is just going wrong for dawn yeah, right. yeah. She's getting called the, what is it? Is she being called Wiener Dog? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she's being called Wiener Dog. The girl tells her to shit and pushes the door open. Like, <laughs> every single thing that she tries to do gets her in trouble. She tries to do the right thing, raises her hand, says that a boy's cheating off of her. She gets detention. She mm -hmm. does worse on her test. She gets in trouble for doing worse on her test. She tries to run away. She hits mm -hmm. that literal fence. Like, it's just... Mm -hmm. It was all camp. And then I think almost after that literal fence, like it just, the camp qualities that I was finding that I was laughing at went away. Yeah. I mean, for me, some of the campy stuff is maybe what I would just describe as like kitschy rather than campy, right? Like some of the, like a lot of, a lot of the decor and Don's outfits, like uh, a sweater with a chicken in an apron on it tucked into sweatpants um uh she has another one where there are three kittens in a basket on her sweater and she's um, trying to be an amorous opportunity for this boy right so th there's this is her these are, this it. is her best yeah ensemble for me that doesn't hit camp though so much as like i agree quirk I agree. It's, uh, like I'm, I'm it surprised. Me of Green Day. You remember the band Green Day? Green Day, that's like funny. early '90s Green Day. Like very. That, that's what it kept reminding me of. Like just mm. this grunge phase. That's not really like the Red Hot Chili Peppers grunge, which mm. you know is barely grunge. It's not Nirvana grunge. It's more Green Day grunge. Like y you know, like mm. we're white. We're not affluent, but like you know, we have what we need. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're finding a, like a way to complain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it was too satirical for me to really think, feel it as camp. Um, I felt it very much uh, to be a movie about like just Solanz's view of a world that 
uh, doesn't appreciate outsiders, that doesn't appreciate people who don't fit into, like, the mainstream culture's uh, norms, right? Like, I think I would agree. I just didn't think that at the moment. Yeah, yeah that was uh, what I was running with. Two, two lines that I felt like sort of summarized his uh, thesis, if you will. One is the principal after she's um, gotten in trouble for hitting a hitting her teacher's eye with a spitball. He says, we're not here to understand you, Don. Um, (laughs) Similarly, there is a little, like, uh, framed sign on her teacher's desk that says, what is it about no that you don't Don't understand? understand. Uh, To me, those both are all about um, a world that says no to people who don't conform to whatever standard it is. If it's a standard of beauty or just a standard of behavior, um, which I think is kind of a campy thing with campy being somewhat about like perversity. Oh, interesting. That was really my access point. I think I definitely find it to be like a kind of bleak view of the world, but I also just appreciate how kind of brutally honest it is about um, how uh, shitty it can be to be one of those people that uh, like mainstream culture just is rejecting. Um, yeah no. for, yeah i think you're totally right because you remember this moment where they're like going up to the chalkboard doing uh longhand math mm. and she's doing the math and she she got a d minus right on that on mm-hmm. that test and, but she's going through the motions of trying to be part of the group right and the yeah. boy next to her isn't like doing anything and he like writes something I, I don't remember what he writes, but he just writes something in words instead of working on the math problem. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he's getting kicked out and sent to military school or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. So, just for not f- fitting in, he's he's being uh, extricated. And even though Don's like just is out of the loop and and separate from the social group, she's making the effort. And that's what allows her to stay with her D minuses and keep yeah. working on the chalkboard. And yeah. that's very interesting. That just kind of triggered that thought for me and made it all unlock. Um, so there's a moment in a movie, I think, called Wonderstruck. Mm. Uh, yeah. Todd where Haynes, they yeah. go to New York and they come mm. out of the New York uh, subway. And it's just this wonderful, vibrant, explosive experience. Yeah. I was thinking about that when she went to New York, and it oh. made it like way funnier for me. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the big city through the eyes of a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, Don is having a hard time, hard time hacking it in the suburbs. The big city seems daunting, <laughs> or like maybe a little consuming. Her little dream um, sequence. Then she wakes up next to home yeah. this guy against a gate. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, yeah, and I could see how the the second half might, like, let the air out a bit because it's maybe not quite as, um, I don't know. There is kind of that rhythm in the first half hey, of... Hey, cat, stop. Pawn away. I will throw a ball at you and you will become distracted. <laughs> the first half, first half has that rhythm where uh, she can't catch a break right mm-hmm. time and time and again. And then there's almost, like, more plot to the back half. Um, but to me, there was great irony to the plot in that everything about Dawn is sort of undesirable to everybody around her. So she's not the one who gets kidnapped. It's her sister. sister yeah. um, which, to me, is, the like, the irony of her <laughs> being the undesirable one. And then there's this added layer when the sister comes back. And now the media is descending on the house in that brief scene. And everyone's scene. too busy for her. Right. And now, so it only means that in the in in the end, there's going to be more attention on the younger sister. Um, to me, that's just like this this joke about her um, <laughs> being rejected by everybody. But at least she's not the one kidnapped. It. But but she's still <laughs> rejecting the boy that liked her all along. And that's what makes her. Like her her own fleshed out character that's not necessarily like sympathetic, mm-hmm. in like a whole way because she could have what she wants, but she's saying no to this boy that wants her, so she's yeah. not being completely rejected. She's rejecting somebody else who's 
who's like you know, you know he is very much not the main focus of the movie but every time we see him he's almost just getting rejected and he's almost more sympathetic and pathetic than she is yeah he is super sympathetic <laughs> uh like we, we spend enough time with dawn we get enough scenes with her where there's the upbeat music to like kind of lighten the kind of like relentless um like misfortune she has to deal with but uh like she's really not the only outsider of the movie right like the gay kid is um right in the thick of the the homophobia of the 90s right like there are there is a ton of that stuff here this is the mid 90s Um, exactly that most definitely came to mind um and the dude who the 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 other kid who ultimately gets shipped off is looks like he you know has a it's coming from a terrible home um, he's got time, like a wound on his forehead, so you you just yeah. know that his dad beats him. It, yeah, it just looks like he's coming from a you know, just a uh, an, like an impoverished situation. Um, so that only adds to it. Like, not only are these like outsiders who are not welcomed at all to the dollhouse, um, th- they're also like not really helping each other in a way. Um, so yeah, to me, it is like it, it, it is sort of seen like mainstream culture as this this dollhouse with certain standards that certain people are just are not welcomed into because of um because of they don't know um, how to play nice they don't know how to they're not they don't dress right they, they don't have they don't have the right teeth yeah. um and you know and that's what makes it so brutal is like some of this stuff is like unchangeable right like her appearance is like a big part of this like movie um so i think I, uh they definitely yeah. play that up yeah 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 um so yeah, it's. Uh, I always hear about Todd Solons as a feel bad director, and I think it is kind of a feel bad movie. But I just I I admire the, the the honesty of it. I guess definitely. I I agree with the, it being honest and him being a feel bad director. To me, he's if Alex Ross Perry was only negative. Mm. Yeah, kind of. Like they very much have the same visual vibe to me, and one is, you know, I never know with ross perry if it's going to end up happy sad or like in between mm. golden exits i think was very much in between um yeah. but i think with todd salons it's just always gonna be negative <laughs> i think it's safe to and assume. the winner might be a dog <laughs> <laughs> i think that is correct although in wiener dog dog doesn't win the dog dies right? he, he comes close he wins he gets to log out <laughs> if an elephant's sitting still shows hubo winning then the dog won there you go (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah so not one i'd watch i'd recommend if you're like yeah i want to feel good movie no No. but if you want to dig into some todd salons i think this is a good intro do you do you think this is camp in retrospect i don't actually i agree i I don't think it's camp i don't know why it is labeled (laughs) as camp i I don't yeah. know what camp is. <laughs> I, We're going to end our camp episode more confused <laughs> than ever. <laughs> All right. Let's get to Joan Crawford. Johnny Guitar. Johnny Guitar is a 1954 picture directed by Nicholas Ray, the first and foremost cult director for that group of French critics who eventually became the new wave directors, Truffaut, Godard, Romer, etc., and who pointed out Ray's keen visual style and his consistent themes. Nicholas Ray had studied architecture under Frank Lloyd Wright, and this might explain in part his fascination with juxtaposing many of his anguished characters against the environment in which they exist. Johnny Guitar, streaming on Hulu, directed by Nicholas Ray, starring Joan Crawford, Sterling Hayden, Mercedes McCambridge as her rival? I uh, cannot remember that. Emma, yes, yes. Uh... I like this movie quite a bit. What about you? I also like it. Uh, I don't know quite a bit, but I, I really like Joan Crawford in it. Yeah, I, I like it. It's just... It's a three. You know, it's it's a 64. It's not a 66. Is a three like a like a pickle that could come with a sandwich? Like, yeah, you could take it or leave it. No, nah, I'm taking this one. <laughs> okay. This is a take it. Yeah, and no, I... Joan Crawford's perform... I, I haven't gotten to spend as much time with Joan as I'd like, and I, I think that just being able to watch anything much like Jane Fonda and Barbarella with her is mm. just a privilege. 
So oh, I, yeah. that that's definitely why I like this one the most. Oh yeah. Not for its western vibe, but for its um the quote that you went for in your review. Mm. One oh, of my yeah. favorite quotes all week um for what mm. we've watched for this episode and Joan's ability to act with her eyes and her mm. body. Um I watched uh Long Day's Journey in tonight the 19 19- or 1950s version with Catherine oh, yeah. Hepburn uh, last week and so I, I got a very recent dose of Catherine Hepburn and she is such a full bodied actor she really was just uh, a, a gift to mm. us as viewers and I think that there's a lot of similarities between how they manipulate their bodies and their body language between Joan and Catherine mm. and then what Joan has that Catherine doesn't have but she what she has i like even more than what joan has but what joan does is the silent era uh eye acting Mm. um which just it it totally works in a in a campy screenplay like this oh yeah yeah i would agree i think it's a towering performance um she's far and away the the top performance for me here i like that the the movie itself sort of uh, dupes you into maybe thinking this is about Johnny Guitar when this is Vienna's movie, um, and I, I think uh, it's uh, just such a uh, satisfying character. Like I just I like how uh, unwilling she is to uh, give in to any of the people around her. Right, um, right. I think part of the camp has to do with um the sort of like androgynous almost masculine quality she has right like she is sort of um she's wearing pants yeah definitely yeah yeah first scene Um, comes down the stairs wearing pants she's at the top of the the building she owns the building she's wearing the pants you know that that is a a thing that we say for a reason yeah um it's in point nine in Susan, Susan Sontag's essay as a taste in persons camp responds particularly to the markedly attenuated and to the strongly exaggerated the androgyny is certainly one of the great images of camp sensibility um, she compares it to um, like 16th century paintings and that kind of thing um, the most refined form of sexual attractiveness consists in going against the grain of one's sex. Um, I don't know. I, some of that's just kind of interesting to me to see um, her um, taking great pride in having um, built this gambling parlor for herself, um, delighting in hearing that um, roulette table spin because she knows it's the sound of what she built herself um, running. Um, and these are, you know, just the qualities that you, you always see attributed to men in Westerns. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, it's just, it's just kind of the independence, like how, how, um, she will be damned if anyone's going to take this place away from her. I just respond to it. Right. She sends away for her long lost love from half a decade ago, brings him in to pay him to play music for her. Mm. you know normally that would be the the boy sending for the the girl this is the girl right. sending for the boy um and and instead of like the beautiful girl singing it's the it's the handsome man playing yeah. guitar and singing yeah um there there's certainly a, a gender reversal and that almost makes the two-thirds in more earned when i mm. i think that the it be the um her building begins to burn what is it called the casino um, casino or is it, I don't remember if it? it has a name. That's a good question. I I just could never decide whether to call it a saloon or like a gambling parlor. It's, I yeah, guess it's okay. both. Oh, but yeah. yeah, one of the two. Haberdashery. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll go with the haberdashery. <laughs> when it begins to burn, um, they go underground, and she's she's wearing mm. a dress at this point. She had been playing the piano, right? Oh, great. And scene. they they go underground after he's saved her from hanging is that right yeah yeah he takes a very small pocket knife and holds it up to a thick rope and it falls apart like butter yeah it's yeah. a very <laughs> hilarious camp scene and very smooth they go underground to the mine shaft and uh her dress catches on fire yeah, yeah. and then she uh she has to take it off and she's wearing like the small white slip uh-huh, and yeah. 
like all of a sudden there's this like moment that almost doesn't fit in the movie mm. but also feel felt really earned and like that was the one time where she like let him be the leader almost in yeah. in their relationship yeah. and and hold her and it, it was just like really really sweet because right after that they're back to her leading and and taking him to where they're gonna go and she yeah. kind of leads the conversations from there yeah 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 completely agree that it's it's more earned after you've seen the the opposite take its uh turn for or most of the how movie. about those yeah. those scenes where he's like lie to me uh I, he's great too um, I, I really liked that scene yeah i really uh, liked that scene yeah, I I personally do really like melodrama. I kind of I do like uh, s- certain movies with with big emotions. The scenes of uh, them together, do particularly on. Do I have a on. movie for you? Oh, what are you thinking? It's starring Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> oh, is is Long Day's Journey into Night melo- uh, kind oh of a melodrama? God, yeah. Is it? Oh, that sounds good. Catherine Hepburn <laughs> is mentally ill. Oh, is that what it's about? Yeah. Oh, I did not know it's that. Amazing. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Add it to the list. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that probably also feeds into its camp classification. You know, some of the big emotions that people would say, "Oh, oh this is so over the top." I, I, I just find it satisfying because oh, it feels sincere. Why. I thought it was because Emma shoots the chandelier lamp. And there's a lamp in it, <laughs> oh. therefore it's camp. Lamps are camp. Lamps are camp. That is According what to I took away from the essay. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's a heck of a chandelier. That just a, she's cleaning it, right? Is that what is that what's happening when it comes down on a couple of occasions? I'm trying to remember why. Why do I remember the giant chandelier? Um, well, Emma shoots it. it. Yeah, she shoots. It. Yeah, and and we okay. we keep getting lingering shots on it. Yeah, it's just a giant yeah. chandelier. Yeah, yeah, giant. Uh, well, no, they bring it down to light it. You're right. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, I was because like, because it, it is a fire so lamp. Well. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. So you can't uh, not talk about women's sexuality in this movie, right? I would agree. So the the hero is a woman who owns her sexuality and sends for the man who she loves and maybe made her feel the most sexually vibrant based on what we might take away and what I've heard you say about the colors mm. outside of this conversation about how she begins to put on more colorful clothes yeah. when this boy yeah. is there <laughs> versus when he wasn't there from the sounds of it. So if if that like if we agree that that's part of the conversation then Emma's hatred of um what is it the kid the dancing kid? Yeah, yeah. The dancing kid is, um, according to what we hear from Joan Crawford, because of him leaving her after right. she Spurned. realized her sexuality with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In turning the whole town against him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of sexual tension, you could say. Some. Um, involving multiple characters. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh Emma uh, Mercedes McCambridge, I think. Did you like that that actress? I was so debating watching her. I was like, I have no idea if Taylor's going to like this. I don't. Not. I don't dislike her. I think that I think that it's a trope character and trope dialogue. Mm. So I don't know that I can judge because she's such a side character whether or not it was good performance. Mm. I really don't. I, I don't think there was enough screen time, the ability for her to make enough choices for me to go one way or the other. I know I didn't mm. hate her, and I know I didn't love her. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of in, down the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and on the uh, on the topic of sexuality, one thing I wasn't sure about was when uh, Vienna's having that kind of like long conversation with, Vienna being Joan Crawford, is having this long conversation with Johnny Guitar towards the beginning they're kind of reminiscing and that kind of thing and she's talking about how she got this place up and running and she talks about having um caught word from the like surveyor that the railroad was coming to town and i thought it was implied that she got that information by sleeping with him um and she said something like you know uh, a guy you know sleeps around and you know he's uh 
you know, he's nothing happens. He's patted on the back. Yeah, but, a, you know, a girl slips up once and she's a tramp. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I, just multiple angles you could, I don't know. There's something interesting there for me about um, whether or not she um, is um, just willing to do whatever it takes or if even she would be um, frustrated by having to do that to get to where she's gotten with this place. Um, I don't know. It, it, it seems just, like she was maybe frustrated. I kind of think so, and, too. And that's why she sent for him after she got everything she thought in order. Yeah. And then yeah. when he shows up, everything begins going to hell. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, not a major, like, I don't, I don't know, not a huge thing, but I just thought it was interesting for a movie that's so much about, like, who likes who and who's willing to, to die and, and kill someone because of it. Um and her being very much about having done this by herself, what exactly that might mean to her, I thought was just kind of interesting. Um, and he was certainly not happy about it. He, he feels like, you know, um, you were supposed to wait for me. And she's like, I got shit to do. Did you wait for me? I think <laughs> yeah. she says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. So there's there's something pretty honest in there um, that, just, that just felt right. Um, but, uh, yeah. I love how the guns are like fencing foils. Oh yeah. They're just like, oh, it's I mean, it could kill you, but you can also just like shoot guns out of people's hands and you know, just oh, yeah. it it had that level of camp <laughs> absurdity that Barbarella has that I really really liked. Definitely. Yeah, definitely the like I, I I don't even think about like the word campy and western in the same sentence, but yeah, this if is there both. is this is it definitely. So we had four camp movies that we selected for this week. Love in the Time of Monsters. I think it's camp. Do you think it's camp? I do. Barbarella. I think it's camp. I do. Welcome to the Dollhouse. I don't think it's camp. I do not think it's camp either. Johnny Guitar. I think it's camp. I think it's camp e. Camp e. Yes. Well, yeah, it's Western. I, I think that camp is definitely a subgenre. So I, I would say, yeah. like, Love in the Time of Monsters would be <laughs> camp genre. And that's the only one that I would, would agree. be camp genre. Right. Barbarella would be sci fi campy. Yeah. And then Johnny Guitar would be Western campy. But Welcome to the Dollhouse, yeah. I, I don't even think camp is a subgenre for it. I agree. Yeah. It's more like irony. 100%. Yeah. Or kitschy. I don't know. That yeah. Was, yeah. I think both. Yeah. I think you just mm. keep saying, uh, you know, things that are equivalent to absurds. Yeah. And, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that is, uh, that, that's it for this episode this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about some sci-fi. Done with camp. Time to go home. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant. You're the best and we love you! <sighs> now I gotta pack up my bag. I gotta, <laughs> gotta make sure my mom's gonna be at the drop-off point. I gotta get home from camp. I don't wanna leave my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never... Well, don't you love how, like, your friends in camp are never the same like you never interact the same once camp is over no definitely ever. Not. it's just like it is a bubble. these small bubbles <laughs> of moments <laughs> and that's the camp genre too <laughs>